Oh, God, the power of your love. Let me rise like an eagle. That's what we needed to hear on the cusp of a new year. Not yet. It's not the new year yet. Some are still here. But here we are. The word of God is front and center now. Hide this voice and all the other distractions. Have your way to the max so that like Josh and Andrew, we can acknowledge that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Did, did you know that the last time Japan hosted the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, I was a little 12 year old brat running around that city. At the time, it was the largest city on the planet. Today, it is still the largest city on this planet. And I, I'm going to tell you this I wasn't just a 12 year old kid, I was an unbaptized 12 year old kid. And the reason I know that is because the next year, 1965, I got baptized in the Harajuku Central Church, which I tell you the truth was and still is less than a half mile walk. Come on, less than a half mile walk to the iconic 1964 Tokyo Olympic Pavilion, uh, like a pagoda, an iron roof that just twirls into the sky. And I got to also remind you, if you're my age and older, that the, the star of the Olympics in Tokyo in 1964 was a kid named Don Scholander, only six years older than me. So he was 18 at the time, and he ran away with, he swam away with four gold medals. Wow. The, uh, he, was ending, he ended up being christened the most successful athlete of the 1964 Games. And all of Japan celebrated and by the way, in the same city, 57 years later to the month, another American named Caleb Dressel swims away with five gold medals. So Tokyo and the Olympics have been good for American swimmers. But in 1964, I remind you, it was very different than in uh, 2021. Tokyo went bananas over the fact that they've been asked to... Uh, to host the Olympics. Because if you subtract 20 from 24, you'll get the year. And that's 1944. In 1944, Japan was a pariah on this planet. So to become the poster child of the great Olympics was a big deal. And they pulled out every stop. And it was an unforgettable event. But what a difference COVID-19 can make. Shut down the 2020 Olympics. Almost shut down 2021. The uh, NHK, the big a corporate uh, communication giant in Japan. They did a, a survey in July. Nearly two-thirds of the Japanese were not persuaded the game should go on. So they came that close. But because of COVID, everybody knows the protocol. Government forbade any foreigner to enter the country for the sake of the games or anything else. The same government forbade any Japanese spectators from sitting in $3 billion worth of new stadiums that are now empty. Unbelievable. Here's a picture of the, of the Tokyo Stadium. That's the city of my birth. I was born, so I'm kind of proud of this, but uh, born in that city. 35 to 37 million people in one city. Go figure. And that beautiful stadium was empty. All the athletes knew it was empty. We all knew it was empty. But you know what? Kudos to my Japanese cousins. Through the, master, mas, through the mastery use of graphics, they were able to put black and white creations in all the seats. And so in the unlighted areas, it looked like the entire stadium was full of people. You go. But we knew the difference. Yeah, it was too bad. Let's go this morning to, to another Olympic stadium. We'll go two millennia back. That's 2,000 years back. We'll go to Athens. Oh, boy, the stadiums back then were certainly different. And I've stood in some of those amphitheaters. We're talking about Hard Rock, not Hot Rock Cafe, but this is Hard Rock Stadium because it's just solid rock and it goes up and then back, up and then back, and up and then back. In fact, let me here, here's one of the uh, stadiums, an amphitheater. You see that? All stone, all stone. People crowding it way up here in the bleachers. They even had bleachers back then. And everything's happening down here. It might, down here, it might be wrestling. Who knows what kind of sport. The, the Olympics, by the way, go back to 776 B.C. So we're not talking about some fresh new upstart games here. 
The writer of Hebrews knows all about this. And he writes the opening line of chapter 12. And I'd like to invite you to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, will you? Hebrews chapter 12. I'm in the New International Version. Thank you, Debbie, for reading it. Thank you, ladies, for leading in the music today. That was beautiful. I could, I could listen to you all day long. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, NIV, verse 1. Therefore, okay, the writer of Hebrews, he knows about this picture. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, amphitheater, see, all the way around, surrounded as we are, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I want to tell you something, folks. That verse has the Olympics written all over it, doesn't it? I mean, here is this stadium. It's an, it's an amphitheater. And who is filling the stadium? How does the author put it? He says, this stadium is filled with people, like a, like a great cloud. And some people think the cloud means these are people that have already gone to heaven. Wrong, wrong, wrong. In, in that day when the writer wrote Hebrews, cloud meant the way of describing a large throng. We would say a crowd of people, but back then they would say a cloud of people. These are people that have gone to heaven. No, these are people. Well, it turns out they are dead. But they are a vast throng of witnesses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Peter O'Brien, the Australian commentator, the demonstrative such a great, speaking of such a great throng, the demonstrative such a great is emphatic and draws attention to the number and magnificence of that assembly. We're talking about what well, we would call them today superheroes. I mean, that's what we would call them. They were not superheroes. They, they were just average men and women and children like you and me and Enoch and, and Rahab and Gideon and Abraham and Sarah and Moses. They're called, the, the writer calls them uh, witnesses. And the Greek word for witness is martus. Martus means anybody who observes something take place and then turns around and reports what he or she observed. Martus. But when the writer is writing this in the Christian circles of the Roman Empire, the fledgling church, in, in those circles, the word martus began to refer and be recognized as a way to describe those who at the cost of their lives have now borne witness that Jesus is Lord. Say Caesar is Lord or you're dead. Jesus is Lord. Gone. Martus. From whence comes the English word martyr. That's who's in that cloud. Oh, they're there, sound asleep in Christ, but the memory of them. In fact, the chapter ends, you, you got to see this. So, so here's verse 1 of 12. Just go back. Go back up to verse 35. This is Hebrews 11. This is the Bible Hall of Fame. Talking about superheroes, that's what we think of them as. The Bible Hall of Fame, the Bible Hall of Faith. No, we think they're all just, you know, easy peasy stars. No, they're not. Watch this. This is at the end of the Hall of Fame listing. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers. Some faced flogging. Some faced even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And the greatest line in this entire Hall of Fame chapter is the next one. The world of whom the world was not worthy. This planet was not worthy to have men, women, and children who would pay that high a price to stand up for what they believed. And I want to tell you something. This culture, this society is not worthy. It's not worthy to have the Andrews and the Joshes in this space. This society that mocks the existence of God, that laughs off the notion of a savior, that lives by the motto, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die of whom this society is not worthy. People like you and these boys who just got baptized, of whom the world was not worthy. 
They, were, they wandered in deserts. They wandered in mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet not one of them received what had been promised. That cloud is not them already having gone to heaven. No, no, no. They haven't even received what's been promised. Why? Because God has a plan. He's planned for something better for us, you and me and them, so that only together with us and them would they be made perfect. Isn't that amazing? God says, I'll wait till everybody's ready and we'll all, we'll have the party together. The huge welcome home party and everybody will be there. Man, I, I, I got to move to an altar call right now. I want to be in that party. Don't you put your hand up. I want to be in that party. When they bring all, when the saints come marching in, oh, I want to be, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Yeah, me too. So the whole purpose of this Bible Hall of Fame, Hall of Faith chapter is to spur the likes of you and me so that no matter how difficult, no matter how painful the ordeal turns out to be, we will not quit. We will not back out. You hear what I'm saying? You know what I mean? We will not stop and say, no further, no further. I know, I know a lot of us claim, uh, complain about COVID-19, hate these masks. Vaccinations, ah. We complain about how inconvenient life has become for us and then we read the last five verses of Hebrews 11 and we say, my Lord, what am I belly aching about? Those last five verses is the, is the author of Hebrews say, whoa, 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 hush your mouth. You ain't seen nothing yet, kids. And guess what, he's right. We got darker days coming. You're bothered by a little mask, you haven't seen anything. You haven't seen anything. That's what this Hall of Fame, Hall of Faith, and then the first lines of chapter 12 are to steal us up, are to, to iron in the soul so that when it comes, we're not wimping out. We're not running away. Mask or no mask, we're not leaving. My. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, I'm telling you something you already know, but I want to reinforce it. No Olympic runner that you watched, and we watched the Olympics, no Olympic swimmer that you saw, no Olympic athlete in Tokyo 2021 kept on their warm suit, warm-up suit. The cameras would track them coming into the track and field. They'd have that warm-up suit on. They'd be loosening around, loosening up. But the moment would come when all of that comes off. They're stripped down to almost nothing. Those swimmers, they'd come out and they just peel off that stuff. There goes my warm suit. Get into this pool, splash that water. Okay, bring it on. Let's go. And by the way, kudos to those young Norwegian women beach volleyball players who said, you know what, we're not going to wear those skimpy bikinis that have been decreed by a group of corporate men sitting in an office somewhere saying we got to increase our ratings. Let's have the women in bikinis. We're not going to do it, they said. We're going to wear something that covers us. We'll be fine. And I want to say in Norwegian to those girls, you go, girls. You go. And as an aside, and I think this probably was not on the, not on the mind of the author of Hebrews, but as an aside, you women who are here listening right now, watching somewhere, you're going to have to stand up and speak for yourself like those Norwegian girls. Don't let, don't, don't let this culture turn you into a, to a gaping object. Don't let this culture corrupt you into thinking that if you dress, dress with as little as possible, you're going to win the heart of a guy, you're going to win the heart of a man. You will not. You may win their eyes, but you won't win their respect. Follow the Norwegian girls. I'm proud of them. Nah. Let us, let us cast aside, cast aside anything. What is it? Anything, everything that hinders, anything. The sin that so easily entangles. And isn't it interesting? We say, what sin? He doesn't say. Why don't you tell us what sin? Because he says, I don't have to. You already know. The moment you see a sin that entangles, it came to your mind. That's the sin he says, I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking the warm-up suit off. 
so that you can run this race without anything getting caught in your legs and causing you to stumble, fall, and lose the race. Whatever it is, take it off. Whatever's in your life right now, throw it out. You don't need that to win this race. In fact, he'll kill you if you keep it on. Boy, he doesn't mince any words, does he? He doesn't have to tell us what it is. I know. We know. <sighs> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You see that word race? Here's here, this word. Where is it? Where is it? Come on. Race right here. In the Greek, it's A-G-O-N, a gun. A gun. Just put a Y on it and you know the American word, the English word. What's the, what's the word? Agony. The word agony is based on the races. It's what you go through when you're just, when you're just breaking down for that last burst. Agony. Now, some of you guys remember ABC's Wide World of Sports. You have to be about my age. Yep. You have to be about my age. For 37 years, they had a very successful season on television, Wide World of Sports. And the renowned sportscaster, some of you will remember him, Jim McKay, he would read a, scli- a, a, a script as various clips are taking place as different sporting activities. And in that opening sequence, he would tout these words, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And when he said the agony of defeat, the little video clip in that opening montage was always the same. It was of a, of a ski jump skier. So he goes down. You know the ski jump. You go down and then you go up this thing and, you, and you, you're just leaning forward, leaning forward. And you think the guy's going to fall over and just leaning forward, leaning forward. And you're dropping, dropping. He had that, that day when the cameras were rolling, a spectacular wipeout. He survived. It happened in Oberstock, Germany. And just as that wipeout takes place, Jim McKay says, the agony of defeat. Well, the agony is, is the agony of sports. It's the agony, the agon of the race. Wow. When Hebrews calls the race an agon, that is a strong hint as the previous ending of chapter 11 has already reminded us that the race you and I are in, I know you didn't get to pick to be in this race, but it's the one you and I are in. It is no picnic in the park, I'm telling you. This thing is full bore. It is high octane. It is a run for your life to the finish line. So let us run. Uh, How's this go here? So let us run with perseverance. Do you know what that word perseverance means? That word means you don't quit. You do not quit. Don't quit. Do not give up. This race is going to be, it's going to test you to the metal of your soul. And there are going to be days when you say, I'm quitting. In fact, there's some of you who are feeling that way already and the summer isn't even over and the school year hasn't started. And you're already thinking to yourself, I'm not going to make it. It's just not going to be possible. You're already considering giving up. You're thinking about throwing in the towel. And there's another sport metaphor for you. You're thinking about throwing in the towel. I quit. I can't do it. It's too big. It's too hard. You cannot quit. You cannot quit. It's the agony of the race. Of course it's tough. Of course it's hard. Guess what? It was supposed to be. The race you're on right now, I'm going to prove it to you beyond the shadow of a doubt. It was supposed to be tough. Watch this. There's one other line I want to draw to your attention here. Look at this other line. The race marked out for us. Now, this is technical language that the the Greek readers knew because the race masters used to do this. They would decide, okay, this year's, this year's race, where's it going to be? And so they would sit down together and they would plan, they would chart a course not to be sadistic and create just this killer of a course, but they would create a course for two reasons. Reason number one, they wanted to test and display the abilities of the runners. They want the the throng, the cloud of people in that stadium. They want them to see, look, look at this. Look at what she has built up. Look what he's doing. Number one, that's what they wanted. And number two, they wanted to assure the athletes Hey, guys, this, there is a finish line. Trust me, the masters of the race have designed it. There is a finish line. You are not forgotten and on some tangent that will never come to an end. There is a finish line, so don't quit. Don't you dare quit. That's why they did it. Guess what? Somebody else, capital S somebody, called the master of the games himself, 
has come down to you. Because notice this, it's been marked out for you and me. He's looked at your life. The master whose own feet have been down the pathway as he designed and tested your race course. And by the way, don't you be looking at me. I can't be looking at you because the the race you're running is not the race I'm running. We are on different courses. We have a different race in front of us. Same finish line, but different courses. And by the way, that capital S somebody, the master of the games, he knows who you are. The maker of all things loves and wants you. He wants the very best for you. So he, devi- he, desi- he designs a course that is going to bring out your very best. It's going to be painful. It's going to feel like you're going to lose. It's going to create agony in your soul. But this course will make you shine for him. And so he's designed it because you need this skill now. You have no idea, Junior, what is coming ahead. I do. You need this gift now. He has designed the course specifically for you, specifically for you and me. Wow. So don't give up. Don't change courses. Don't say, you know what? I don't like this course. God, I'm on another, I'm a, I, I, I started another race. You can't. You can't. Stay on the course. I've designed it for you. My. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I love that word, pioneer. It's one of my favorite words in all the English vocabulary. And Jesus gets the name. He's the pioneer. This is the Pioneer Memorial Church. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. I'm telling you what. I, I got to share this with you. There, there are three different uh, translations here, but I love all of them. We just read this is the new NIV, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Here's the old NIV, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And just this spring, the, the new New American Standard Bible, it's, it's called 2020, but it's actually, it came out in 2021. I like the way they render it, looking only at Jesus. Isn't that something? Looking only at Jesus at Jesus. I find that compellingly beautiful. Just look at Jesus. Come on. I don't know what you're thinking about right now, but for the last seconds that you and I are together, just put Jesus in your mind. If you have a hard time doing that, just look at the big rose window above my head. He's sitting on a cloud. He is coming soon. Just look at Jesus for a moment. Looking only at Jesus. A few weeks ago, I pulled out Dietrich Bonhoeffer's wonderful short book, Life Together, about building Christian community. And as I'm reading it, he stresses the importance of beginning each day with some quiet time alone in the Word, but it's the way he expressed it that just made a believer out of me. And I said, with my new New American Standard Bible, I'm going to try this method. And so I'm trying it right now. I've only been trying it for a couple weeks, but let me share with you his words. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, who at 39 crossed his finish line. Because you're going to cross the finish line either at your death or at the return of Jesus. That finish line is in front of you. You don't know how close that finish line is. And that's why quitting now, quitting now, that is impossible. Never, never give up. He was 39 years old when he crossed the finish line, dead. Radical young disciple of Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, in our meditation, we ponder the chosen text. So you choose whatever text you want. Nobody's telling you what you got to read in the Bible. I decided with my new New American Standard Bible that I would start with the story of Jesus. So I start with Matthew. And I'm, I'm, I've been working over for a week and a half now, just verses 18, 19, 20, and 21. But that's his method. Just go a word at a time. There's no rush. In our meditation, we ponder the chosen text on the strength of the promise that that text that you've chosen has something utterly personal to say to you for this day and for our Christian life. It is not only God's word for the church. We say, well, this Bible is just a church's book. No, 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 no. But that book, God's word, is God's word for you and me individually. Come on. You can do this. Watch. And now... 
the, by the way, he says, this is the very reason why we begin our meditation. So this is a good idea every morning. We begin our meditation with the prayer that God may send his Holy Spirit to us through his word and reveal his word to us and enlighten us. So whenever you open the Bible, you already knew this, but I just remind you, always say a prayer. Spirit, I know you're here because this is the book you inspired. I need you to speak to me. There's a word here. I don't even know yet what that word's going to be, but use it to communicate your directions for my race today. I humbly pray. All right, so you pray the prayer. Now he's going to give three of these. He says, it's not necessarily what you think. And I like these three. Number one, it is not necessary that we should get through the entire passage in one meditation. A lot of people say, well, I started here. I got to get, I got to get done. No, 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 no. Stop with one word. You got one word? Then stay on that word. Who knows what that word is going to do? Number one. It is not necessary that we should get through the entire passage in one meditation. Number two, it is not necessary that we should discover new ideas in our meditation. Often this only diverts us and feeds our vanity. Now, I'm in a room full of people that for, for their careers, they teach the Bible. I can see them. They teach the Bible. And sometimes th when they have worship, it's just really, oh, I've got to find something new. I mean, I have to go and I'm going to stand in front of the students here in a few hours. I can say, you know, when I was reading the Bible this morning and I need something really radical. Watch what Bonhoeffer says. No, 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 no. We don't have to discover something new in our meditation. Often this only diverts us and feeds our vanity. He says, relax. This is not show and tell for your class. This is show and tell you and Jesus alone. You have nothing to report to anybody, not your spouse, not your kids, not your roommate, not nobody. This is you and me. It's not necessary that we have to discover new ideas. And above all, finally, number three, it is not necessary that we should have any unexpected, extraordinary experiences and meditation. Oh, God, I have such a critical need right now. Would you please write on the wall as you did in Daniel 5? Never pray that prayer. Because when God writes on the wall, that's bad news. You do not want God writing on your wall. Don't ever ask him to write on the wall. It's judgment. I mean, you, you just say, God, just make, make it clear in here. That's all you have to say. Don't ask for the wall. Above all, it is not necessary that we should have any unexpected, extraordinary experiences in meditation. No, sir, this can happen. It can happen. We're not ruling it out, Bonhoeffer is saying. It's just not a sign that the meditation period has been useless. Man, nothing great happened today. Well, sometimes I eat the breakfast of champions. That's Wheaties. Did you know that? Wheaties. You want to grow up and be strong, eat Wheaties. It's the breakfast of champions. But sometimes I eat it. It's just soggy corn flakes in warm milk. It's just bad. You don't have to have a gourmet meal every time you sit down to be alone with Jesus. It might be soggy Wheaties today, but who cares? You're alone with Jesus. Something will be there in your heart, and you don't even see it or sense it. It's okay. It's not a sign that you just wasted your morning. No. Seek God, not happiness. Oh, I like that. I don't know what he's quoting. Seek God, not happiness. This is the fundamental rule of all meditation. Just seek God. Just look for God every morning. Is that hard to do? No. In fact, let me summarize it. Uh, number one, pray for the Holy Spirit. Number two, read slowly through God's word, word by word. We've already dealt with that. Number three, trust God to bring a personal word from you from his word today. That's it. What are you, 13 years old? It's perfect for a 13 year old. Maybe you're 12. It's perfect for a 12. In your teens? Perfect. College student? Look at The point is, it works for everybody. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I watched one of the runners in the, the most famous of all races. It's always, it always is because the winner of this race is declared for, for four years to be the fastest human being on this planet. It's the men's 100-meter dash. It happens in seconds. I know it's 20-something. I, I forgot to look it up, but it's just fast. So here are these eight runners. This, they, they, this is going for the gold now. They're all there. They're not in the blocks yet. They're kind of wandering around. And, I, and the camera zoomed in on one of the runners. I don't even remember who it was. Camera zoomed in. And I'm telling you the truth. I'm looking at that face. And it is as if the face is looking one million miles away. 
Have you ever talked to somebody and it's clear they're not in your space? They're not anywhere near you. They're a million miles away. And that man's, that young man's face was, a, the eyes, a million miles away. There's some vision. There's some vision he's keying in on. And, they, and he's looking straight into that vision. And in a moment, they're going to say, on your mark. And he's going to be down on those blocks. And he'll wait for the retort. Electronically signaling the race has begun. But he's far away. What's going on? He's fixing his eyes on the goal. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. We have to do the same. Take a look at Jesus. Just take a look at Jesus. And by the way, when the author of Hebrews says, I want you to concentrate on Jesus, what part of Jesus' life does he ask us to concentrate on? Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, here it goes, endured. That's the same word as perseverance. He endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down on the right hand of God in the throne of the universe. The author is saying, you want, you want high octane help for your race? Look at Jesus when he runs his race because it is, it is at Calvary. Ladies and gentlemen, it is at Calvary. When we watch, slow-mo, slow the camera down. Slow the camera down. You got to watch this. He's going to cross the crimson finish line. It is at Calvary. And when he crosses that finish line, he throws his head up and he calls out to the universe, it is finished. It's over. I won. I won. I finished the race. And because he finished his race, he can help you finish your race. He can help me finish my race. My race isn't over and neither is yours. Don't you ever give up. I don't care what is going on in your life right now. The crucified master of the games has already set up your course. He has already walked the course. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He's already gone the way. Look at this. Desire of ages. I'll end with this. The way to heaven is consecrated by the Savior's footprints. The path, the race course may be steep and rugged, and it is. But Jesus has traveled that way. The course that you're on, he's already been there. His feet have pressed down the cruel thorns to make the pathway easier for you and me. Every burden that we are called to bear, he himself has borne. Hallelujah. Amen. He has walked this. He has run this course ahead of you and me. And because he finished the race, we can finish it. Ah, one more time. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus. You know what I wish? I know it's on the cusp of a new year, but I wish we in this congregation and we on this campus and all of us are running right now. We're running to beat the band. We're giving everything we have to, and it feels like we're not making any forward progress. I understand. It's agony. But I wish that out of the races we are running together, somehow the word would be seen in you and be seen in me. Boy, he's a guy. He knows Jesus. He knows Jesus. She knows Jesus. I mean, can you tell it? The world has fallen all around her, coming down. And her eyes are still fixed on Jesus. Since mine eyes have looked on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's vision, gazing on the crucified. I don't know who wrote it, but for several years now, I've memorized that little verse. But if every morning you and I went to this book that's all about Jesus from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22:21, 21, and we took a moment or two gazing, Jesus, fixing our eyes, let us look closely only at Jesus. I do want to end with an altar call, and I want to ask you if you would be willing to join me. The new year hasn't even started yet, I understand, but join me in saying, you know what, Holy Father, I choose 
by your grace. For the race ahead, I choose to fix my eyes on Jesus. Anybody want to send that prayer to heaven? Just send it with me. Raise your hand. The, the, the angel beside you, the spirit knows. I choose this new year to fix my eyes, to turn my eyes on Jesus. I want to take an extra moment to thank you for joining us in worship today. It's by the continued support from viewers like you that we're able to bring you this program. Today I want to invite you though to share with us how this ministry has blessed you. I get inspiring notes, emails from viewers literally all over the world telling me, look Dwight, God has been blessing me this way. He's been doing this. I would love to hear from you as well. Just visit our website, you know it, newperceptions.tv and click on the contact link at the top of the page. Send me a note. Let me know what God has been doing right now in your life. Once again, thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll join us right here next time. And until then, may the God of grace journey with you every step of the way.